In this lecture, we will talk about the Wigner Monte Carlo method for single body systems. Uh, this is a quite technical lecture, and I will skip many of the mathematical technicalities, but you can see every details in these two papers that I am mentioning in this slide. Uh, the whole thing about the Wigner Monte Carlo method uh, started in 2000 practically when uh, this uh, paper of Dimov and Gurov appeared. And this is a paper about the Monte Carlo algorithm for solving integral equations, so it's a pretty general mathematical tool. Uh, it took about 14 years to have a practical um, application of this method in quantum mechanics. And the first application essentially was uh, published in this paper in 2014 on uh, Monte Carlo methods and applications. So this is where practically you find all details, uh, all mathematical details about what I will talk uh, in this lecture. Um, we will uh, introduce a Monte Carlo method for the Wigner equation. I may remind you that the Wigner equation is a partial integral differential equation. So it's a very, very complicated equation. You have no way to solve this equation analytically. And even numerically, it, it's quite complicated too. Uh, Monte Carlo methods, from this perspective, they introduce some big advantages. Uh, one of them is uh, um, the parallelization. You can obtain a very high, very deep level of parallelization, which is hardly conceivable with other methods. Um, what we will try to solve by this Monte Carlo method is uh, this uh, equation here, where the unknown is the, the Wigner function, which is a positive distribution function. So the first step to introduce this Monte Carlo method is to um, define a semi-discrete phase space. Uh, we don't discretize actually the whole phase space, so this is why we, we call it semi-discrete. Uh, the only uh, discretization that we introduce in, is in the momentum space. And it, it is done by introducing this delta p that you see here. Um, which is the step in the, um, in the, in the momentum space, or you may see it as the length of a cell in the, mo in the momentum space. And this delta p is defined in terms of this L, which is a free parameter. And this parameter is essentially defining the, the, the level of the, um, of uh, discretization of the mesh in the momentum space. Uh, does, uh, in practice, uh, what we will have is that this quasi-distribution function now, um, which is usually written in these terms, it's uh, defined over um, um, continuum phase space. We will now rewrite it, uh, it in this way. So essentially, you can see now here that the, the momentum is defined in terms of a multiple of this delta p. Uh, where this uh, capital M is, uh, is essentially an, an integer number. And to make it shorter, we will write it like this, Fw of xm. So uh, your quasi-distribution function now depends, is defined on, uh, let's say, a position, which is a continuum variable, and on the momentum, which is now an integer. And the integer comes from the discretization of the momentum space. So to proceed further, once we define a semi-discrete phase space, it is possible to define, to rewrite, or to redefine the Wigner equation in terms of, uh, or let's say, in a semi-discrete form. And the semi-discrete form, without going through the, uh, the technicalities, is uh, essentially the equation that you see here on this slide. Uh, you may notice that now um, the diffusion term here is uh, defined in terms of a multiple of this delta p. And you may also see that the integral that was here is now a sum, a, a sum over the momentum. Um, also notice that the Wigner kernel now is redefined in terms of a finite domain here, which is introduced by uh, these L, uh, this free parameter L that we defined earlier. So this is essentially how a semi-discrete Wigner equation uh, looks like. Uh, if we go further now, 
uh, we may um, play a little bit with the, the mathematics and we can reformulate the semi-discrete Wigner equation as an integral equation. In particular, we can rewrite it as a freedom integral equation of second kind, which is what you see here on this slide. Uh, I am not going through the technicalities and you can find all mathematical details in the two papers that I mentioned at the beginning. So the message here is uh, just that we can reformulate the semi-discrete Wigner equation in terms of a freedom integral equation of second kind. Um, why do we want to reformulate this equation uh, in this form? Uh, essentially, the, meaning, the, the, the reason for that is that if we have a, a, a freedom equation of second, time, a second kind, whatever the equation is uh, or come from, uh, you can always write the solution of this freedom equation of second kind. Formally, you can, rewrite, you can write the solution in terms of what is called a Liouville Neumann series, which is this thing that you see here. And the definition of this Liouville Neumann series is uh, the the one that you find here. You redefine, I mean, you define the zero term of this series uh, like uh, like this. You define then the um, every n term of the series uh, like this here. And here you you can see that this thing de uh, depends now on the kernel, which is defined like this, and uh, the kernel is defined in terms of the original kernel of, uh, in, in your freedom equation. So knowing now that you can formally write um, a solution for the Freedom equation, uh, we can exploit this fact and write formally a solution for the Wigner semi-discrete um, equation. As a matter of fact, uh, we can rewrite also macroscopic variable in terms of series now. We can uh, practically uh, express ma macroscopic variables in terms of the of the uh, Liouville uh, von Neumann uh, series, and without going through all the mathematical details, what you obtain is that whatever macroscopic variable you take here, this can be written eventually as the series that you see here, and we can calculate the terms of the series because we know how to calculate. A Liouville von Neumann series. So if now we proceed ahead, we may show that without again going through the technicalities, we can show that, for example, the first term, the first term A0 can be written in uh, li li like this term here. You can write A1 and it will look like this term here and so on. And the interesting thing is that if we focus first on the first term of the series, this A0, uh, you can see that there is an exponential here, and this exponential from a Monte Carlo mathematical point of view uh, is uh, represent, um, represent um, the probability that a particle that is starting in the phase space coordinates xi and m prime stays in that trajectory. And this is given by this is given by this exponential here, which is giving you this probability. Um, if we proceed further now and we write, for example, the sum of the first three terms, a0 plus a1 plus a2, we start to realize that things are quite uh, I wouldn't say easy, but intuitive. You may see essentially that all terms are branching every time. So here we have the first term that we saw before and we know how to interpret this thing now. Then we have like, for example, you see this second term here which is telling you again what's the probability that the particle staying in, uh, in the phase space coordinates x1, m1 will stay there. Uh, in the interval, in the time interval starting from t, uh, t prime and going ahead till uh, t1. The same thing for this term here. This is telling you what's the probability that the particle stays in the phase space coordinates x2, m2 in the interval uh, t1, t2, and so on. 
So practically, you see that these things are branching, and we could we could go ahead with uh, more terms in the series, and we would see that it's always the same story. Um, the new thing here is this gamma function here, which I report here, and this is an interesting term because we may interpret this term as a creation of two new particles, a positive one here, a negative one here, and the the extra term here is essentially telling you that we keep the particle, uh, the original particle. So in a sense, we can now depict a Monte Carlo, uh, a Monte Carlo method telling us that a uh, th uh, there is a particle, an original particle that, with some probability, will create a positive and a negative particle. As a matter of fact, to make everything easier, we can say that the gamma now is a particle generation rate, which is defined in these terms here, and the Wigner potential, which is also referred to as the Wigner kernel, generates two particles, one with a positive sign, one with a negative sign, and the sign is essentially carrying the quantum information of the system. So we na we now show that this algorithm, uh, even though so it sounds quite uh, complicated, it's actually not so complicated to implement if you go through the paper, and you end up with a very short code, which means that practically it's a very performing code. So uh, here in this picture we show that um, a first benchmark test, which is a quite a um, tough numerical test to do. Uh, we essentially start by a delta function which corresponds to say that all your particles in your phase space are staying in the same uh, phase space coordinates and if you are in specific conditions where you have a constant field essentially what you will have is the motion of this peak this delta function should move in, in, the, in the phase space. And the way it moves um, is uh, depicted here. And the interesting thing is that we have exact analytical solutions for this. So we can uh, essentially uh, do the experiment, numerically speaking, and we can compare these things with the, numer with the analytical solution. And this first experiment here is essentially showing you that uh, even for extremely big times, as you may see here, like we have 5 femtoseconds, but then we go till 3 picoseconds, and we go till 5 picoseconds, which from a, a quantum uh, perspective are extremely big numbers, extremely big final times, you see that essentially we have a very nice behaving algorithm. Uh, the, the the peak here is moving again and again and again, and there is almost no loss of particles here. You may notice that we have oscillations here. These oscillations actually make sense because a delta function is a function that is not really um, realistic from an experimental point of view. And essentially, what these oscillations are telling you is that uh, the, the Heisenberg principle is preventing you to have this, uh, this, uh, this delta function. And so, you have this oscillation which makes perfectly sense anyway. So, this is a first benchmark test that we published eventually. And this was the first proof that the algorithm, this Monte Carlo algorithm that we suggested, is is actually working. And finally, we present a second exciting test, which is a benchmark test, which is this Wigner Monte Carlo method against a Schrodinger uh, equation. So you may uh, know that the Schrodinger and Wigner equations are mathematically equivalent, so they should give exactly the same predictions, wh whatever the system is. So in this case, we restricted ourselves uh, to the case of a wave packet, initially a Gaussian wave packet, moving towards a uh, potential barrier. And what we do is to see what, what is the reflection, I mean, how the reflection will go and uh, if we will have some tunneling through the barrier. 
so we have done the same experiment with the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, but the Schrodinger equation was done in a finite, uh, different uh, way and uh, with the time implicit algorithm. So you, you may understand that this algorithm is extremely different than the Wigner Monte Carlo algorithm. And even, even though what we see here is a very, very nice agreement between the two solutions, this was actually the first qualitative agreement between Schrodinger and the Wigner Monte Carlo uh, that was published. So this is a further proof that this Wigner Monte Carlo method, despite the weirdness of concept of positive and negative particles, is actually working. So this is a Monte Carlo method, method that we can use to solve the Wigner equation and to simulate the Wigner equation. Uh, and with this, we will conclude this lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.